Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Hello, I'm Gary Miller, Provost of Wichita State University. Welcome to Wichita State in the World. Through this series, you'll meet researchers, top thinkers, and leaders whose innovative work is reshaping our community, the state of Kansas, the nation, and the world. In the fall of 2008, Dr. Don Lamb visited Wichita State University as part of the continuing Watkins Visiting Professorship in Physics and Biological Sciences. The professorship was created by the Watkins Foundation in 1974 and is now provided as part of the endowment of the Wichita State University Foundation. Dr. Lamb is Professor of Physical Chemistry at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Germany. Here's Dr. Lamb's lecture titled, Where the Bio Things Are, The World of Biophysics. I'd like to welcome you to a interdisciplinary Watkins visiting professor lecture. Uh, this lecture was devised as a very nice way to kick off a biophysics seminar series that we're hosting this semester. And there's a handout on the table there for anyone who wants to pick up the list of the seven biophysics uh, talks that are going to occur this semester, which is um, four of them in the biology uh, seminar series and three of them outside of the biology seminar series during the physics seminar time slot, of which one of them is even uh, hosted by uh, Bethel College in Newton, who's paying for the visitor to come here. And so it's actually a university-wide, beyond our own campus, um, cooperation. Uh, today, I'm very proud to welcome and introduce to you Professor Don Lamb of the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, where he's been a professor there since 2003. Don Lamb is a native of Wisconsin and got his BA in physics and mathematics from the Illinois Wesleyan University in 1986, then went on to a PhD at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign uh, in 1993, where he worked with Hans Fraunfelder, who actually started the field of biological physics. And so we're gonna hear now from Professor Lamb on the topic of where the bio things are, the world of biophysics. So thank you, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here in Wichita and to uh, be awarded the uh, Watkins Visiting Professor uh, ship here, and also to have the privilege of kicking off the biophysics series here at uh, Wichita State University. So now imagine as uh, the walls of this auditorium will turn into a woods, will go through the woods, go over the water, as Max did, to where the bio things are, and talk about what is biophysics. Now, Throughout history, there's always been so the one genius or the other genius who has interests in very many different areas. And one of these experts or one of these geniuses would be Robert Hooke. Uh, Robert Hooke lived in England around the middle of the 1600s. He was a national philosopher. In the middle of the 1600s, there wasn't really the word physicist. That was coined much later. Uh, and he was known for his study of the sciences, of the physical sciences. But he was also a mathematician. He was an architect. He ended up building about half of London after the Great Fire, uh, and was also a microscopist. He wrote a very famous and influ influential book called uh, Micrographia. And in this book, he had many uh, illustrations. One of them is shown here, where he showed from Cork this little structure of living systems called which he coined the word cells. Now, they, they reminded him of the cells in which monks would live, and so he coined the word cells, which we now use today to describe all of these, this so fundamental block of, of life. 
Then about 100 years later was another one of these geniuses. This was Luigi Galvani. He lived in Bologna. And he taught, or he was, I'm sorry, he was a physician as well as a phys physicist. And he learned playing around with frogs that if you put a spark on a frog, that the legs will twitch. And also later found out that there's a connection between electricity and muscle and nerve cells. But again, this is a time, let's say this is an era before really the fields of physics and biology have developed. Right? It's hard to talk about biophysics until we know what biology and what physics, physics are. And according to Merriam-Webster, actually physics was coined or formed in 1715 as this uh, science that deals with matter and energy and their interactions. And it was later in the 1800s that biology was, was, was coined as a word and framed. And actually around the end of the 1800s, uh, physics, classical physics had great success and was you know, fairly proud of themselves and uh, thought that they could solve all of the world's problems. And you, you see that there's a, really in this time era a very diverging philosophy between the biologists and the physicists. Take, for example, the cow. If you talk to a biologist, what is the anatomy of a cow? You get this nice picture. You, know, you have all of the different parts categorized. It's compared to, to other types of cows or to... Uh, you know, other types of mammals, what type of organs are there. You talk to a physicist, they say, okay, let me first make the assumption that the cow is a homogeneous sphere with a radius of one meter. <laughs> of course, the idea of uh, the, the joke of the spherical cow is well known in the physics community, a fairly old joke, but it goes to show the point that there's really a very different way of thinking between the biologists and the, and the physicists. Right? A biologist, if he wants to model interactions, he goes, he looks at all these different interactions, he categorizes them, you get this nice little model of how, you know, the, which process interacts with which process. The physicist says, hey, okay, interactions. That means two things come together. Let me take the simplest one and see if I can describe it in great detail, you know, with, from fundamental laws. This means the systems that we study are totally uh, independent and separate, right? The physicists, they treat, they love the harmonic oscillator, right? We'll treat everything as the harmonic oscillator. If you get some sort of physicist that's very, um, let's see, adventurous, he might go out and solve, you know, the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, but that's about as far as we can get of exact solutions to physical problems. Whereas the problems in biology are much, much more complex. You know, the Krebs cycle has interactions of very large molecules. You have signaling reactions in cells that have, you know, hundreds of interaction partners. And it's a very, a very different world between the biologists and the physicists. The reasoning that each party takes is also very different, right? A biologist likes to categorize his different species. So you start out with the humanoids, and you divide them into different categories, subcategories, sub, sub, subcategories, you know, so you get finer and finer in detail. The physicist, he likes to put everything together to unify them. So you have Maxwell's equations that unify electricity, magnetism, propagation of light. And of course, we'd like to at some point have the grand unified theory of everything. So we like to simplify everything to a simple theory. The instruments that we use are very different. You know, so we have the uh, biologists that use you know, maybe a simple microscope, pipette tips, uh, the physicists, the size of their toys are a little bit different, so in honor of Nick here, I show CERN, um, which is on the you know, several kilometer uh, scale. And not only are the instruments we use different, but of course, we look different. <laughs> so so what, what happened, right? I mean, here you have, you know, at this time point around the 1900s, uh, a very different philosophy. Here's the geneticist uh, Jacques Monod, who would say, look, life could be compatible with the laws of physics, but it is not controlled by the laws of physics, right? Talk about, uh, from the physicist's point of view, Ernest Rutherford, he says, science is either physics or stamp collecting, <laughs> right? 
so you have these really different philosophies to summarize what we were just talking about. Physics, we love elegant experiments on simplified systems. And there are some very beautiful experiments, which I will not talk about today, about biological systems which are put in a vacuum and studied at 3 degrees Kelvin. And of course, then one thinks, what is the bio biological relevance in vacuum at 3 degrees Kelvin? That's a different story. We like to unify theories, like I said, Maxwell's equations. And biology, biology, they like to collect very many different facts. And they like to you know, be descriptive, comparative. And the systems you deal with in biology are very complex. And so you have very complex interactions. So what changed? Or how did these fields of biology and of physics come together? Well, first of all, this came together. And what you see is there's a lot of uh, physicists that were very influential in the development of quantum mechanics. And so after having succeeded in describing the, the hydrogen atom, the question is, OK, where do we go from here? And you had Neil Bohr's, for example. He uh, was convinced that some of the physics that you use for describing quantum mechanics, in fact, this what, what, they, what he calls complementary Tate theory, where you have, for example, this uh, particle wave dual, dualism. So you can describe you know, light as a particle or as a wave. And he thought, you know, we could probably use something like this in biology to be able to describe biology. On the one hand, it's the interaction of simple molecules. Now, on the other hand, is a living system. And so he looked into questions dealing with life. Another one of these physicists was uh, Erwin Schrodinger, who was famous for his Schrodinger equation. And later, in 1948, wrote this book, What is Life? And the Physical Aspect of the Living Cell. And that's book, from what I've heard, I haven't read it personally, I must admit, uh, but from what I've heard, the biology is fairly incorrect. But it was a very uh, stimulating book from thought here, from ideology, and was very influential in, in waking the interest of many people to go into the area of biophysics. Friedrich Hund, who developed Hund's rules for filling up the atomic orbitals, he said, the future of physics is in biology. And there's Max Delbruck, is, part of, is perhaps one example of a physicist, he did his PhD in theoretical physics. And after finishing his PhD, he spent six months working for Niels Bohr and got interested in these questions about life and basically went and trained himself as a biologist and is one of the fathers of molecular biology. And his interest in biology is the work that stimulated Erwin Schrodinger to write this book. Then later on, there was, of course, a lot of other physicists, Wolfgang Pauli, who was interested in life, Linus Pauling, who was actually in competition with uh, Watson and Crick for di discovering the structure of DNA. Richard Feynman uh, is also one of these geniuses who was in many areas, is thought as, as uh, had developed the area of nanoscience, which of course, uh, bioscience, biophysics is part of nanoscience because the machines that we look at are on the same nanoscale. Is also often quoted in talks on molecular dynamic simulations because of this beautiful phrase. He says, everything that living systems do can be explained by the wiggling and jiggling of atoms. Manfred Eigen is another person, uh, another uh, professor in the, who, you know, physicist who studied biological systems. And in fact, when he was at the University of Illinois visiting, uh, he was once asked a question, what does a biologist have, or what does a physicist have to do to add biology? You know, in other words, you know, if you want to become a good biophysicist, what do you have to do? And his answer was, oh, that's simple. He just has to become a biologist, right? And so you have to somehow take on, you know, both approaches, both ideas. So if we want a definition to work with, what is biophysics? Well, one of the best places to go to would be the Biophysical Society homepage, right? They should know what biophysics is, and there's a very good description there of what biophysics is. And we can describe biophysics here as, or they describe it, biophysics is that branch of knowledge that applies the principles of physics and chemistry and the methods of mathematical analysis and computer modeling to understand biological, how biological systems work. Or another way of saying that is when somebody asks me, what do you do? 
I say, well, I'm a physicist. I uh, have an appointment in chemistry. I, used, uh, I study biological systems, and I use mathematical analyses. Um, so it's an area where all of these different fields come together. It's a cross-section between physics, biology, chemistry, and mathematics. So what do we have? We have physics that can bring new things to biology. And in fact, whenever there's a new development, a new advance in technology, this often rises to new information in biology. And so you can think, for example, the impact that microscopy has had, light microscopy, the development of the microscope, has re really revolutionized uh, biology. Then in the 1930s, the development of the electron microscope, and there's a lot of other microscopies that are involved. We have X-ray, you know, X-rays. We have magnetic resonance imaging, early, earlier known as numer uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. We have mathematical modeling, bioinformatics that we can bring as tools to understand biology. And then we have our framework, our, our philosophy that says, look, we want to understand things quantitatively. I want to, you know, numbers. We talk, we talk, talk about electrical, electrochemical potentials when we talk about cell membranes. We would like to bring in thermodynamics, you know? you know. We talk about entropy, en enthalpy, free energy. You, know, you want to have some number. Uh, we talk about diffusion for transport processes. We do molecular dynamic simulations. And we try to develop this theory of complex systems. Of course, being quantitative is sometimes good, and other times it's not always good. When I worked in uh, the area of medical, medical biophysics, you know, there were some projects going on. People were doing optical biopsies. So you wanted to measure tissue with light and get a number, and then you say whether it's cancer or not. And somehow, just using a number is a little bit oversimplified in this case. And so you need not only the perspective for the physicist to try to quantify what you have, but you need also the idea of being a little bit more comparative and quantitative to compare a number of things in, 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 your, you know, in a quantitative manner. What biology brings... Well, first of all, it brings a lot of challenging and interesting problems, right? It's something that's a little bit easier to sell when you're saying, you know, I'm doing, studying something that has to do with life. Um, instead of Nick, you know, he says, well, what do I do? I throw, you know, little you know, atoms, protons together and see what, you know, what happens when they crash. Um, and a laboratory, it's also a laboratory for discovering new physics. And in fact, uh, Niels Bohr, said uh, there has to be new physics in biology. So what does this mean exactly, new physics? Well, here's my thesis father, uh, Pro Professor Hans, Frau Hans Frauenfelder, who really developed the, idea, the notion of biological physics. So which we can first start out and say, OK, in biophysics, we could say biophysics is physics where physics is the, is the servant. And the goal is clearly, or unambiguously, to understand biology uh, of the living systems, yeah? Whereas in biological physics, we'd say, I mean, there's a lot of different aims, but one goal of biological physics is to describe the physics of biological systems and to discover physical models and possibly even find new laws that characterize biological entities, right? Every time you go to a new level of complexity, you need new physics. Right? You can solve the Schrodinger equation for, for the hydrogen atom. But now if you take diamo, uh, diatomic molecules, you know, it, then it becomes challenging. You can't do it anymore uh, ex, you know, analytically. If you now take you know, an, a protein that has 1,000 atoms, you, know, you can simulate it. But you can look for different ways of trying to quantify these interactions. Another way of saying this uh, would be to quote the great mathematician, Stan Ulam, who said, ask not what physics can do for biology, ask what biology can do for physics. Okay. And I prefer to include both of these aspects, what physics can do for biology and what biology can do for physics in the realm of biophysics. Now, biophysics has an extremely broad span of topics that is in included in this general definition, right? If we say, well, it's an area where you have you know, chemistry, biology, physics all coming together with the help of mathematics. Uh, this includes things from molecular interactions up to cl climate models, right? I mean, so you have and everything in between. Now, for example, 
we have molecular biophysics. That's the area where I specialize in. And in fact, one of the speakers, uh, Daniel Galepsi, has also had developed mathematical models, which he applies to interactions of molecules. We go up a scale to sort of the cellular system, and where you understand signaling processes or things on the cellular scale. You have cellular, bi cellular biophysics, and that's Professor Shikira Nova. We'll talk about that. Neurological processes, so how the brain works, how information or you know, neurons fire. Uh, that is another area of biophysics. Stephen Small will be talking about that during this lecture series. In medical biophysics, I mean, these are areas where you can apply, you know, where you apply things directly to, the, to medicine. And here, there's two experts on nuclear man magnetic resonance or magnetic resonance imaging, Daniel Fiat and Jan Zeus Henkewitz. And then there's other topics as well, biomechanics, cybernetics, radiation biophysics, and the list goes on. There's just a, a lot of different topics. For this talk, you know, I can say the first of all, uh, the, um, if, if I want to start with what you're familiar with, I can say, well, let's take x-rays, for example. X-rays sort of discovered in 1885 by William Röntgen. Uh, it's clear that this has, bio, you know, has medical applications. I think all of you have seen x-rays at some point or another. This is one of the first x-rays ever taken. This is the uh, hand of Wilhelm's Röntgen's wife. And you can see here her wedding ring sitting on the ring finger. Uh, and he was actually the first Nobel laureate in physics, receiving the Nobel Prize in, in 19, uh, 1901. Another development in the 1970s is then this nuclear, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, which has developed now to a very powerful method in, in medicine. I think that's very clear. But these methods, both X-rays and NMR, or MR, uh, let's call it NMR, because we're not dealing really with, with people at this point, are also useful in molecular biophysics. And so let me concentrate for the rest of this talk in molecular biophysics. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to you know, give you a short introduction, what, what's important, and give you examples uh, first from where it started and from today, but the examples from literature. So if you're interested in what I really do, you'll have to come on Monday. Um, so the, for, there are basically four types of biomolecules which are of interest, uh, which basically uh, make up the vast, vast majority of all biological systems. So you have sugars, fatty acids, nucleic acids, and amino acids, and they build up the polysaccharides, fats, lipids, membranes, DNA, RNA, and proteins. And these are sort of the players now uh, that we want to investigate. What are their properties? How do they interact? And the place where they interact is the living cell. And so just to give you an idea of flavor, I mean, when I talk sometimes with physicists about biology, you know, you talk about proteins. Oh, yeah. Um, so, how, you know, in this food, how many types of proteins are there? And it's like, okay. So you can read on the cereal box there's protein, but that's not exactly what I study. Um, so if you consider now a cell as, like, say, a small island here in Nasu in the Bahamas, you know, this would be in parallel to a cell. Right? So you have an outer a coastline that gives you sort of a, a cell membrane. So the plasma membrane or the border of the cell is determined by the, the lipids, the membranes. You have other, you know, let's say, borders between water and land or other isolated sections. You, know, you might want to keep people out of the airport here. And so you have different organelles within a cell. It's comp comp um, compartmentalized. The sugar is sort of the energy source that drives how the cell works and also provides raw materials for building different things. The, um, you have the membranes. They make sort of the borders between different parts of the, of the island, of the city. The blueprints would be like the DNA, yeah, the plan. How does everything work? Where is the information? You know, if I want to make a school teacher, how do I do this? Those, that's encoded in the DNA. But the proteins, they're the guys that do the work, right? So you can see here the different roadways. They're made up of proteins 
here called microtubule. Those are sort of the, you know, what we call the, the interstates in the cell where things are transported along. And it's, the proteins are the taxi drivers, the garbage collector, you know, the doctor. They're the little nanomachines that do the everyday work of life. Now, let's say the, really, uh, the real emergence of biophysics, you can say, started with, first of all, the, the uh, determination of the structure of DNA. And so this was, uh, this structure determination was aided greatly by X-ray, uh, X-ray scattering in this case. Here's the actual X-ray photo from Rosalind Franklin that was very influential in Watson and Crick determining what the structure of DNA was. And so you have this nice double helix uh, structure of DNA with base, uh, coupled base pairs which won them the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1962. And although we now have the correct structure, not everybody gets the structure correct, as shown here by uh, Sherlock Holmes looking at the model that Watson had uh, made and says, excellent try, my dear boy, but could you bring me an air? Can you bring me a mirror, please? Um, in fact, if you look in literature, there's lots of times you see left-handed helix instead of right-handed helices. Beyond the development of the DNA structure, there was also the protein structure. And this was a few years later in 1958. And I mean, before this time, structure, the structure of proteins were thought to be basically colloids. One had really no idea of what, what these little beasts were. And then using X-ray scattering, they were able to determine the electron, electron density map and make a model. And here's the first protein, myoglobin, which is also the protein I did my thesis work on. Uh, showing that it's a little a globular protein and that it's actually organized. It's like an aperiodic crystal. There's a position where each atom belongs in, in a protein. And the structure is sort of the structure of DNA, the structure of proteins is the basis and the fundament of where we can now start to build up and look at interactions and look at how these systems work with uh, uh, molecular accuracy. Now, this is enough of history. I think uh, you're interested in knowing where biophysics is today, what can we do today. And so let me show you, this is where we were in 1961. And now I can show you how the, far the, we've advanced. And so here's a picture taken out of an article from 2007 showing the structure of RNA polymerase. <coughs> and so you can see where we are. Actually, we're at much, much higher accuracies. We're down to accuracies of less than one angstrom. And the larger complexities, we look at really large protein systems, systems now not of 18 kilodaltons for myoglobin, but to half a million uh, kilodaltons and larger, where you can actually then have different pieces coming together. And in fact, the schematic here, which is really from a publication in Nature, Structural, and Molecular Biology from 2007, but the, the paper is describing sort of the advancements in the laboratory of Roger uh, Kronberg, who won the Nobel Prize in 2006 for exactly this structure of RNA polymerase. And it's you know, in the Laudatio, it says, Kronberg's contribution has accumulated in his creation of detailed crystallographic pictures describing the transcription apparatus in full action in a eukaryotic cell. In his pictures, all of them created since 2000, we can see the new RNA strand gradually developing. Right? And so, this is here, the protein with all of its detail. Now, before we talk about what this might mean, I'm sure the biologists are saying, oh, yeah, you understand that. The physicist sitting next to you says, huh? What are these things, right? So let me just explain a little bit about what um, this protein does, because uh, it's really at the center of life. So as I said, proteins are the little guys who do the real everyday work of life. And the cell is pretty smart and says, look, we don't want to waste energy. It costs a lot of energy to bring up you know, a new protein and teach them what they should do. So if we want a protein that can teach English, we want to make sure that we need English teachers. And uh, so it first starts and controls very specifically what proteins are made, takes the DNA, which has information of how do you make an English teacher, and transcribes it, that's what transcription means, into RNA. And then once you have the RNA, you can translate that now. So you take the RNA and you can use that with another machine called the ribosome to 
describe or to, to build the protein. And then the last step is to get the protein to fold correctly. Sometimes you need help. If you want to know more about that, come on Monday. Um, the transcription process is where this machine, the RNA polymerase, comes in. And so there's a sequence on the DNA. It says, hey, here I am. If you want to make an English teacher, I'm here. Start here. And so you have transcription factors. There's just some proteins. They recognize this place. They bring other proteins. Say, hey, come help me make this, this English teacher. Until the RNA polymerase binds as well, and then it can start running along the DNA. Of course, it's a little bit simplified, so let me give you another simplified model, but that goes into a little bit more detail, and in fact, as a good physicist, you know, I'll replace one lie with a different one, but it's still close to the truth. Uh, and what we have here is the same protein, RNA polymerase, for the biologists, I say this is actually from bacteria rather than from eukaryotic cells. But the principle is the same. So you have the protein. It finds this promoter site. It says, OK, start here. So it binds. But now you have one of the questions. Actually, one of the first questions that arose after the after this determination of the structure of DNA. I mean, after uh, Watson and Crick pro proposed the structure of the DNA, people said, hey, wait. If the bases are pointed inside on this double helix, how is, is the genetic information read? Yeah? How do you get to this information? And so the protein has to first melt the DNA. It has to open it up. So you have to open it up. <clears throat> then it starts converting the DNA into RNA. Often it fails in what's called aborted, abortive initiation. But after having made an RNA of somewhere between 9 and, uh, and 14 bases, there's a conformational change. It goes into the, what's called the transcription elongation complex. It moves along here, uh, converting DNA into RNA. There's a lot of different side processes. And the last thing it has to do, it has to know how to start, how to elongate, has to know when to stop. Yeah, and so there's some sort of sequence, termination, it's still being studied exactly how it works. Uh, and for some genes, at least, there's a hair, hairpin that's formed, tells, OK, I'm at the end of the process. And then the RNA is released. And again, the protein can bind and make another, uh, or the RNA is released, and you can make another protein. So here's the structure of RNA polymerase shown now together with DNA and with a new RNA strand coming out. Uh, the DNA is shown here in this sort of gray-blue, and the R RNA is shown here in red. This is the channel where the RNA is coming out, so you can look in, you can see all the nice detailed structures. There's lots of what's called secondary structure, alpha helices, uh, showing in the protein. There's here over you know, a clamp that clamps down on the DNA, uh, and there's a lot of different channels. And in fact, uh, of course, if I show the secondary structure, these are cartoon images, you know, sort of say computer nicely computer generated. If I do an, a surface image to give you a more complete idea, there's, you see the, the protein is, has, doesn't have as many holes as it looks like. There's actually here the channel. This is where the RNA comes out. And if we rotate it, um, oops. You can see the channel here where the nucle nucleotides come in. You can see here where the DNA comes in. And then the DNA comes, is fed out on the top. And so with the structure, with the detailed structure, you can get, you know, start to build up the basis of the interactions. You can say, OK, here is the metal ion. That's where the catalytic center is. That's where I start to add the new nucleotides. Then there's sort of here the RNA that's being made. There's a rudder which pushes the RNA to the exit channels, tells it to go out, separates it from the DNA that's being copied. There's a fork that helps to get to open up the DNA. You have the clamp holding it down, the zipper that keeps the DNA strands apart. You can start to really look in molecular detail on the interactions that make this thing work. And in addition, what we can do nowadays is we can begin to look, you know, take snapshots at different Confirmations. So we can move, take, take a picture. We can then move the protein one step, take another picture. And you start to get an idea of how, how this process works. Get information over the mechanics. How does this protein do its job, do its function? But one thing is missing when we look at the x-ray structures. You know, trying to do something without structure is extremely difficult. We need the structure. But what's missing is the dynamics. Yeah? So if we want to go to dynamics, we typically have to go to some other method than x-ray. 
There are some neat experiments where you can do time-resolved x-rays, but that's only for processes that you can photoactivate. So to do this, we need other, other methods. And so the methods that I choose are what's called single molecule methods. So we look at one single protein as it does its job. And this has advantages. It means that there's no ensemble, measure, uh, ensemble averaging. If I look at one molecule doing something, I don't have to worry that another molecule that's doing a different thing is disturbing my measurement. Right? So the sample, you can say, is 100% pure. Um, so I can measure kinetics of stochastic processes. I don't have to trigger something to watch it move. I can really just watch it fluctuate, fluctuate thermodynamically between states. I can detect rare events um, and detect information over the heterogeneity of the system. And in my lecture, I say, OK, if we want to measure how people sleep, right? I can ask each one, OK, how many hours did you sleep tonight? How many did you sleep? How many did you sleep? And I can get a nice distribution. There's somebody who slept two hours, okay, that's hopefully a rare event. You know, and, and you can see what the distribution of hours of sleep that people need is, right? And if we were to do this measurement day by day, you can see some people on average, they have a distribution, but they also have an average that's less than another person. Some may, may need six hours of sleep, some need nine hours of sleep. Uh, it varies from person to person, and molecules are really no different. If you want to know about more about single molecules, okay, we can also talk about that on Monday. We also need another uh, technology, and this we'll take from Star Trek, and that's the tractor beam. Yeah, we're going to take uh, light and use it to manipulate objects. Of course, we do this now on a scale that's on the micrometer scale rather than on the, let's say, meter scale here as the Starship is doing. And what we can do is... Uh, actually take a laser beam and grab here these yeast cells. So you turn on the laser, and all of a sudden you can trap with light this, this object, and you can move it around as you wish, right? And then here we can take a second beam, turn on a second beam, trap the second particle, and we can drag it around. Uh, and we can not only move it around, but we can also measure the force that we apply, and we can measure... Uh, the distances between them, where the position of the particle. So we're going to take the same, same machine, this RNA polymerase that we have the nice structure of, except we'll take the bacterial version, the version that bacteria uses. We'll take two laser traps, so we can hold two beads. We have one bead held onto the DNA that's being transcribed into RNA. And the second one we hold onto the protein, and we just want to look at how the protein moves. In fact, there's lots of different models you could think about how this protein moves along the DNA. One could say monotonically, right, from the structure, we know the distance between bases is 3.4 angstroms. And it can be that the molecule moves 3.4 angstroms and ends in the same state as it was then only 3.4 angstroms earlier, then goes to the next 3.4 angstroms, the next 3.4 angstroms. So in a monotonic way. It can also be that there's footprints, so there's part of the, part of the molecule moves forward, then the, the, you know, there's a, another part that comes backwards. Inchworm model, sliding clamp model. So we'd like to see, okay, which mechanism does this protein use? That means we have to have a system that can measure steps on the size of 3.4 angstroms. Well, how big is 3.4 angstroms? Well, it's a little bit hard, perhaps, to imagine, but if you consider going across the United States, so starting here in Lubbock, Maine, going to San Ysidro, California, a total distance of 3,310.95 miles, according to Google Map, which is 5,328.46 kilometers. If we were to take this distance traveled and renormalize that to one meter, then 3.4 angstroms on this one meter would be the same as here 1.8 millimeters on the way between here Maine and the south of San Diego. And so we need some method that can measure with this high accuracy. And this was done, experiments were done in the laboratory of Steve Block, where they could actually measure the position of the RNA polymerase as it moved. And you can see basically, okay, the actual data is here shown in, in this sort of rose color. And the average is here in red, and these lines are drawn to help lead the eye at 3.4 angstroms resolution. And if you can actually do a mathematical 
analysis of the noise spectrum, you can see there's peaks here at exactly well here at 3.7 angstroms. That's not bad. And so you really can see this protein takes individual steps. So every base pair, it moves along the DNA. You can also then start to play, I mean, you, with, with the optical tweezers, which is this technique, you can actually apply different forces so they can pull high forces, so they try to pull the polymerase back from what it's trying to do, or they can pull it forward. And you can see at high forces, it starts to stall. It can't go further. It starts to go backwards. It can take backward steps on occasion. Um, you know, so you can see it goes backward and forward. And then, just to show you, you know, from this physicist idea, we'd like to quantify it. They could actually take models to describe this, what was called the force-velocity relationship. So what's the velocity does this molecule have at different forces? And a kinetic model and could actually distinguish between three different models by trying to fit the, the data in a global way, right? So we, wanted to, we tried to be quantitative, and that gives us insight. Here, this, this is the last model is correct, which means there's a pre-translocation step, a post-translocation step, and that you know, is independent of whether the nucleotide, the next one to be incorporated, is bound or not bound. And we can get information on the dynamics of these processes, which one has, involves the movement. Now, this is one protein uh, that's involved in transcription. Uh, there's other proteins, and there's a very interesting class of proteins which are called motor proteins. So the ones that really move. And those are kind of fun to play with. And so the motor proteins, this is now having gotten a flavor of what biophysics is. You understand now, this is okay, this is perhaps this perspective of how a physicist likes to look at such a protein. Right? So we have... Here, a protein, we say, okay, it has, let's say, a hinge, undergoes a conformational change, so there's a lever, there's a latch to keep it closed or open it up. There might be binding sites that allows different materials to bind. And now we can take our whole arsenal of different techniques and apply it to understand the motions and dynamics of the system. So we can, for example, take, if we can grab onto it with optical tweezers, we can pull on it, or the atomic force microscope, we can, we can also directly pull. We can do protein engineering to, let's say, change the properties of the protein. Uh, we can then, you know, we can put fluorophores so the, the molecule shines. And uh, we can also, for example, release, photo-release things like ATP, uh, which is basically the fuel of the cell. I'll mention that in a second. Uh, and really start to play with these machines and see how do they perform the functions of life. I mean, the motor proteins, here's just uh, one movie showing artificial viruses. That's one thing that we do in our group. We look at how viruses enter into living cells. Again, that will be on Monday if you want to hear more about the budding of HIV viruses. But here's artificial viruses that are being transported along these microtubules. And they're being transported by motor proteins, proteins that recognize the cargo and run along these highways of microtubules back and forth. Uh, the, the gasoline that they use is what's called ATP. Uh, it's a triphosphate. The energy, high energy bonds of the phosphate groups are then hydrolyzed to ADP. And uh, the phosphate, and uh, it's basically then recycled within the body. And in fact, you burn kilograms of this thing of, of ATP every day. It's the main energy source within the cell. So we're going to look at now a motor protein called myosin-5. So myosin-5 transport organelles and cells. So it's basically sort of like a, uh, a, a truck that delivers one particle from one place to another. It moves along actin filaments. So there's a track it runs along. And it's processed it. So this molecule goes many, many steps along a single filament before it falls off. And this is here just a number of images taken from electron microscopy. You can put it together into a nice movie. It looks nice, but it has nothing to do with reality. So uh, if we want to really see how a system works uh, dynamically. And in this particular case, we cannot... Uh, grab onto it with sort of optical tweezers or an atomic force microscope. We need some other way, method of doing that. And so, you know, the question is, in this case, let's say first, what's the question? So how does this protein move? So there's perhaps two models you can think about. One is hand over hand. Now, 
let me just back up for a second. I find myosin is a little bit confusing, I think, especially when I try, try to t explain to somebody for the first time. Because we're trying to discover how this thing walks. It has two heads and moves hand over hand. So we have all types of the body thrown in to just describe this type of motion. Um, and so you can imagine it goes hand over hand, which means the back foot here comes over to the front foot. And then in the next step, what's in the back comes over to the front. Or you can have sort of an inchworm model where the back foot comes to, the, to where the front is and the front one slides forward. So those are sort of the two mechanisms. Which one's right, right? If you can imagine you know, how a child goes through these you know, hanging bars, you can either go to the next one, then you bring the hand to the next one, go further. Or you, know, you can go to the next and you bring the left hand in front of the right and then again in front of the left and so on. So which way does this protein take? And so what we've done, or not I've done, this is actually work of, of uh, some collaborators at, or some colleagues at the University of Illinois. Um, they put fluorescent labels somewhere along this you know, leg of the myosin and watch the position of this, this marker. And if we can measure this position very accurately, what we should see is that in one case, we have some distance x from the middle. And then when it moves, it moves a distance of 37 nanometers minus 2x, because it comes to this side. And then the next step is plus 2x, right? In the case where it slides, this position, the, the distance it moves should be consistently 37 nanometers. Well, how can we measure this position very accurately? accurately? So this is a method called fluorescence imaging with one nanometer accuracy called or FIONA. And it's actually an old method uh, that's been just basically pushed to much, much higher accuracy, to much more, uh, to technically, uh, to much more, uh, to, to much, yeah, more accuracy detail. So what, basically you have the limits of optics, which says you have a diffraction-limited light that's on the order of about 200 nanometers. We can't see anything uh, more in, in more detail. But if I know that I have only a single object in my beam, so I have a single object that's giving me my light, that object has to be located at the peak position of this point spread function. So I just need to determine the peak very accurately, and I know where my molecule is very accurately. And so the better the signal to noise is, the better accuracy you can get. And their, their job was to get the accuracy down to a, a couple of angstroms, I mean a couple of nanometers. So here's a movie of showing how this molecule works. This is the fluorescently labeled molecule. You see it here, then it takes a step. Then you can determine the center position, okay, it's somewhere here. It takes another step, determine the new position, and so on. And during the film, you can see how this molecule takes step by step along the actin filaments that they put on to the surface. And so you can see the motion. So they analyzed this motion very, uh, in, in much detail. They had three different labeling positions. So they put the molecule on three different positions along, uh, along one of the legs. And so you could get, then get these steps. They could make a histogram. And so the, there's one population that took steps of zero nanometers and then 74, or they only saw single steps of about 74 nanometers. And so you can see here how one molecule just changes its position and you can calculate, okay, how much did it move? There's a second population where if you categorize the position, so the difference is the steps it takes, you get steps here centered around 23 nanometers and 51 nanometers, and a second population around 74, which is, in essence, when the molecule took two steps during the resolution that you measured. Uh, and again, the third population you see a peak around 33 and another one around 42 nanometers. All of these sum up to 74, which is what you expect for two steps. Uh, you could then calculate the dynamics. How long does the molecule spend at each one of these steps? And what you can see is for the case where you have, let's say, 
42 and 33 nanometer steps or 50 and, and 23, you get an exponential decay, which is what you expect. The time it takes to go a rate is simple kinetics. But if you have 0 and 74 steps, what you notice is there's very little molecules that have a, a zero time. Because it really, you have to take two steps. There's two processes that have to occur before you can see it. And so you get a rising followed by a falling exponential. And so you can clearly see what the dynamics are, and you can clearly work out, in this particular case, the molecule moves with a hand-over-hand -hand motion. And so the back foot comes to the front foot as the, the molecule walks. Okay, we mentioned ATP. ATP is the driving force that allows this motor protein to go. And in fact, generating ATP is, is a very, there's a very fascinating motor protein that does this called uh, ATP synthase. And ATP synthase is in what's called an organelle, uh, the mitochondria. So if you look within the cell, there's within the cell this organelle, the, it's called the mitochondria, which has an inner and outer membrane. So it's a double membrane system. And it has basically these long different loops. The idea is you want to have a, a large uh, volume or a large area of membrane because you load up this membrane with your uh, protein that's the energy source, right? I mean, the, the mitochondria in our model as a city is the power plant. Yeah, that's where you generate the electricity. And so you have here, so the outer membrane, you have the inner membrane, you know, you transport through various ways sort of the, the fatty acids, your energy source. It goes through the citric acid cycle, generates electrons that are then pumped out to make a proton gradient. And this proton gradient then runs through this particular motor. And when this motor turns, it turns this ADP back into ATP. So it makes it, again, recharges the battery, so to say, that it can be used again a second time, a third time, and so on. And so the ATP synthase is what we're going to look at for the last part of this talk. And the ATP synthase has basically two subunits. One is called F0, the other one is, is F1. Can we actually study the dynamics of this? And the answer is yes. So what we now do is we take this top part where this conformational change should happen, and we take the stalk, we put the attach the stalk now to a protein, and we put basically a long filament. And of course, this is not to scale. This filament, you know, if I were to be the ATP synthase, I'd have to have here a stick that's about one kilometer long, and I tried to rotate this around. And this stick is then labeled with fluorophore so you can see it. So this is a single protein working here on the um, running around. And you can see there's actually different positions that it likes to stick at. So it likes to stick up. It sticks down here. It sticks down here. And you can see how it rotates step by step by step. Uh, and they did this first with this particular essay. Then they, they sort of developed the essay even further. Uh, with different methods, so they go to higher time resolution, and they could actually see the position that the molecule is. And you see there's sort of two areas where the molecule likes to stay. So it takes a 90-degree step and then a 30-degree step, a 90-degree step and a 30-degree step. And so by analyzing this, you can start to get now a detailed picture of what the conformations are, what happens. So you have ATP on one side, ADP and phosphate bind to the next side. Then you have... Uh, you have a conformational change. The ATP is released. This ADP plus phosphate then gets converted into ATP, and then the cycle continues from one to the other. So you have this happening three times per cycle. If you then calculate the energy that's being done by the, used by this particular motor, you can see that the con energy conversion is basically 100% efficient. So the cell can convert energy, this... this um, electrochemical gradient into ATP, storing things in the battery of the cell uh, with very high efficiency. So now we've seen structure, we've seen dynamics. There's something, though, still missing. And what is missing, that's sort of the last step, simulation. So now we have all this information. Can we go back and study it in great detail? 
And so there's people that go around and try to understand here, it's taken from Wong and Oyster from the University of California, Berkeley, where they can do molecular dynamic simulations with the position of each atom and try to see, okay, what happens as the molecule rotates and what are the interactions going on and do we see this, does it fit the dynamic time scales that we measure and so on. And with that, I'll stop. There's a lot of other methods that are currently, or a lot of other experiments that I don't have time to talk about, sort of now ultra high resolution, how we can get optical resolution better than that of diffraction limited resolution, AFM experiments, you know, pulling on proteins, uh, what cryoelectrotomography can do, imaging different types of particles, different biological particles, or some femtoseconds by uh, spectroscopy of how different systems work, like light harvesting systems, which can be used in biotechnology, building better photocells, etc. So where have we been? We've been now to, to see what biophysics is, and I hope I convinced you with these several examples that biology is one of the futures of physics. We can see that biology and physics both have a lot to offer each other. Physics has a lot of, of methods and this idea of quantification it can bring to it. Biology offers a lot of very interesting and challenging problems. And in the area here of molecular biophysics, we work on first knowing the structure, understanding the dynamics, and eventually being able to simulate. If you can, we can reconstruct what we know, then we've understood it. And for me, then I hope we can say both what can, bio, what can physics do for biology and also what can biology do for physics. And thank you for your attention, and I hope as you head back that as Max found that you will also find your dinner still warm. <laughs>